Hello, welcome back. So now we're on to the last class for this reading, which is fantastic news. So let's get started. And we're going to start off with something that's nice and easy. Okay, this is nice and easy because we've seen this before. We saw this in the first class that we did for this reading, where we want to work out the predicted value for our dependent variable. So we know what to do here. All we've got to do is use our regression equation. So this is going to be our forecasted value or our predicted value for the, the dependent variable. We, we know this one, all we do is we take our estimated intercept there, and then we add on this term over here, which is our estimated slope coefficient multiplied by the independent variable. So if they give us this regression equation here, our y if now is the predicted return on stock B. That's what we're trying to predict or we're trying to estimate. And then we know that 0.56, that is our estimated intercept. And then this over here, we know what that is. That is our estimated slope coefficient. And our XF over now, of our XF over here, that is the independent variable. And what is our independent variable? That is our forecast return on the market. So if they tell us, that the forecast return on the market is 5%, all we need to do is plug in 5% for our forecast return on the market. And then we can work at our work out our predicted or our forecasted or our estimated return for stock B. So we plug in there the 5% and we get uh, our forecast return then for stock B is going to be 6.46%. Good. So please may that be on the exam. Right. So now we're going on to the prediction interval around the predicted value that we just worked out on the previous slide of the dependent variable. So this is also not too bad. And the reason why this is not too bad is because we've already done confidence intervals. Remember, we did those confidence intervals, I think it was in the sampling and estimation reading. I know it's a long time ago, but we're going to have some idea what's going on here from what we did over there. So let's have a look. So to calculate a prediction interval or the confidence interval, we can also call it, around the predicted value of our dependent variable. So our predicted value, for example, on the previous slide was the 6.46%. So what we're gonna do here is build a prediction interval or a confidence interval around that 6.46%. So we just gotta use this equation over here. So our Y, that is our estimated, Y with a hat on that's our estimated, our predicted Y value, that's the 6.46%. And then we gotta subtract, uh, subtract and add this term. So our TC over here, this is going to be our two-tailed critical T value. And given our whatever significance level they give us, and we're going to do an example in a minute. And then we've got our normal N minus two degrees of freedom. And then our SF over here, that is our standard error of forecast. And we're going to look and see that formula. On, so big upon, big upon, we're going to see that formula on the next slide, and you might collapse if you haven't seen it before, but we don't have to worry about it at all. So don't stress about it if you're looking at the next slide. So just before we go on to the example, remember we did when, when we did the confidence intervals in that other reading, that sampling and estimation reading, we were looking at the confidence interval for the population mean. And over here, we, you might remember we had over here, we had the sample mean there. And then we built a confidence interval for the population mean around the sample mean. So this is a similar principle. So remember, we call this one over here, we call this the point estimate. And we called this critical T value, uh, we called it the reliability factor, you might remember that. And, and then we multiplied that reliability factor also by the standard error. So it's a very, very similar thing. So let's, let's give the example a go. So they tell us given a predicted value of 6.46% for stock B, that's what we worked out on the previous slide. Now they want us to calculate a 95% prediction interval for this predicted value of 6.46%. And they tell us what the standard error of the forecast is. And we've got, again, the 12 observations. So to work out a 95% prediction interval, we start off with our, ester, with our predicted value there, the 6.46%. And then we've got to subtract and add this term over here. So first of all, we need 
our critical T value, two tailed, because we're going below and above. And let's just go to our T back to our T table quickly. We've got 12 observations. So minus two, we're going to have 10 degrees of freedom. And we're going to be 5% significance level, right? So let's just go back there quickly to where we were before. There we go. So we've got two tail test here. And we've got 5% level of significance there. And we've got 10 degrees of freedom. So there is our critical value there, the 2.228. Right, so let's just go back to where we were. There we go. And then they've given us the standard error over there. So that 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 multiplied by that comes out at 4.49. So what, what do we need to do now? We got to subtract and add this 4.49 to our 6.46. So if we subtract the 4.49, we get 1.96. And if we add the 4.9, so if we add the 4.49, we get the to the 6.46, we get the 10.95. So what does this mean now? This means that we are 95% confident that the dependent variable will be in this range, right? That is what we are saying. Good stuff. And now here comes this, as we said, we're going to look at the standard error forecast formula over here. Now don't collapse because they're never going to ask us to calculate this, but we might just need to understand some conceptual things. So this standard error forecast formula, what we what it is, what this SE is here, it's the standard error of estimate, which, which, which we've already covered. And then the N we know is the number of observations and the XF, this is the forecasted independent variable because X is our independent variable. So in the, for example, when we did this example here, we used there 5%. That is a forecasted value for the independent variable, 5%, right? That's what that is. And then we know X bar over here is the mean of the independent variable. So that's what that is over there. And then this, we know XI, those are the actual independent variable values. And X bar again is the mean of the independent variable. So it's the sum, it's the it's the sum of the square differences between them. But again, we're not going to calculate this. But this is, I think, I, I did see this in the CF Institute book, where they want us to, to understand the concept here. So the better the fit of our regression model, the smaller the standard error of estimate is going to be. And remember, we discussed that. I can't remember because the previous class or the one before, but we have discussed that. So the lower the standard error of estimate is over here on this side, the smaller the standard error of forecast is going to be over here. Right. So the lower the, the, the standard error of forecast is over there, the narrower will the confidence interval be. Good. And then the larger the sample size over here, the larger that number is over there, the bigger the denominator, the bigger number we divide by again, the smaller the standard error forecast is gonna be, because that's the bigger number we divide by, the smaller this value is gonna be. And that again means if we have a smaller uh, standard error forecast, that is going to give us a narrower confidence interval. And then lastly, the closer, the forecasted independent variable is over here, the XF is to the mean of our independent variable, this X bar over there, the, the closer these are together, the, the smaller the numerator is gonna be over there. And again, the smaller will be the standard error of our forecast. And again, the smaller the standard error, error of the forecast is, the narrower the confidence interval. Excellent. So now we've just got one more thing to go and we're done with this reading. And that, that is the functional forms for simple linear regression. Now, if we think back to the first class we did, remember we looked at assumptions of linear regression. And the first assumption we did was that the relationship between the independent and the dependent variable has to be linear. So what happens if we have this problem here? If the relationship between the independent variable there and the dependent variable is nonlinear, we have a problem, right? But here comes the but. We can often transform one of the variables. And if we can do this, then this is, this is going to give us a linear relationship um, 
So that's our big point. This can, if we transform, this can give us a linear relationship. But to, how, and how do we do this? We take the natural logarithm, or just for short, the log of one or even both of them. So we're going to do three examples here. And the first one is the log lin model. So if it means log lin, this means that the dependent variable is logarithmic. So it's easy to remember for the exam, because if we look at the normal formula for our regression, we've always got the dependent variable first. So if it says log, that means the dependent variable, that is logarithmic. And then lin is the second one, which is the independent variable there. So that means the independent variable is going to be linear. Okay, independent will be linear if we are log lin. So if we now take the natural log of the dependent variable, it's going to look, it's going to look like that. Ln is, is for natural log of the dependent variable. This is what we're going to have. So before we read the rest of the stuff, I want us to have a look at the bottom left over here. This is, this is data that's raw. So these dots over here, this is our raw data. And our linear model is not looking too good. So this is a bit of a problem over here because we can see we have actually got, an, we got exponential growth of the Y variable. So what, we, what, what this means is that the linear model over here, if we look over here, when, 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 this, when X over here, this, we can also call that X over here, when X has got low values like this over here, then the linear model it's overstating the dependent variable. Hey, the, in, the, the linear model is overstating the dependent variable. But when our X variable, when it is getting bigger, look what's happening now. Then the line, the linear model, it is in actual fact understating, it's understating the dependent variable because it's way up there. So this linear model is, is wrong. It's understating now the dependent variable. So this model now on the right hand side everything here is looking much better these dots are now rep represent transformed data where we've got the log linear model so now we can read the rest of the stuff and we can either look at this formula here or that formula there because it's the same thing so let's rather look at this one over here so the slope coefficient over here what is that the slope coefficient is b1 there in this model, it is the relative change in the dependent variable. So when, when we've got an, a natural log in front of the, the variable, this means it's a relative change. So the slope coefficient over here now, it's a relative change in the dependent variable there for an absolute change in our independent variable. So if our independent variable, it's got no, nothing in uh, our independent variable is here, if we've got, if it looks like normal, like it just looks like normal, like that we've always seen, then it is what we call absolute change. So that's what we have in this instance over here. So once, once everything is transformed, then it's good news because then we can now use linear regression. We can't use it over here, but we can use it over here. Now, the thing with level one is that we're not going to be doing any calculations here. We're going to do these calculations at level two, but it's so easy because all we do is if we want to work out, you know, what is our predicted value for Y? We do our same thing over here again, like we always do, like we did on the first slide of this class but when we get our answer we don't stop there we're going to just hit we're going to on, on the on our, on our calculator is an e button e function button we're going to hit that button and then it's going to give us this so we don't have to it's nothing really to stress about we'll see next year it's actually going to be very very easy so don't worry about the calculations calculations for now that we'll do next year good and then Lim, what about if we've got a lin log model now the dependent variable that is linear as we said dependent variable comes first so this means dependent variable is linear and, and independent variable comes second so independent variable is now logarithmic so if we now take the natural log of the independent variable there we go we're going to take the natural log of the independent variable there this is what we're going to get so now the slope coefficient over here the slope coefficient there, the, the B1 there, in this model, it's the absolute change in the dependent variable because the dependent variable looks like normal. There's nothing in front of it. It is just our norm, old-fashioned normal dependent variable. But now we've got a 
relative change in the independent variable. Why? Because we've got an LN in front of the independent variable. And then lastly, what about if we've got a log log model? This means now both of them are going to be logarithmic. So if we now take the natural log of both of them, we're going to get an L in L in uh, a natural log there in front of the, the dependent variable and a natural log in front of the independent variable. So this means we've now got Ln in, in front of both of them. So this means we've got relative changes. So this, this means that the slope coefficient now in this model, it's the relative change in the dependent variable there for a relative change there in our independent variable too. Good, fantastic. So that's the end then of linear regression. I don't think it was too bad, like we said in the start of the first class. I think we can definitely score well on the exam here if they ask if whatever questions they ask. And just, just remember, you know, do all of your uh, practice props, CF Institute practice problems, practice other questions. And if you have any questions for me, let me know and, and I'll help you. But until then, we'll see you guys in the next class. Hello, it's Tim here again. I hope you enjoyed the class and found it beneficial. We have some classes available for free on YouTube, but we have classes for the entire curriculum. The classes that are not on YouTube can be purchased from us. If you'd like to purchase the classes, please contact us for the pricing. And I've put our contact details over here. You can purchase all the classes or certain readings that you would like. When you purchase the classes, we provide you with the slides and our notes. I've assisted hundreds of candidates pass CFA exams, and I look forward to also helping you through the CFA program. I've put in two testimonials in the slide over here, and we also have a testimonials page at, on our website that you can review. I look forward to seeing you soon and all the best.